Okay, so this is our last presentation for the day. Dr. Hafer Macko is an Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and the Medical Director of the Myasena Gravis Center at the University of Maryland Medical Center. She also serves as a Co-Director of the Neuromuscular Fellowship and the Director of the Baltimore Veterans Administration Medical Center Neuromuscular Service. So Dr. Hafer Macko, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, I can't do it while you're sharing. There you go. Hold on. Okay, you should. This will stop you from sharing. Yeah. Can you see them okay? Perfect. Just put them in presenter mode. There we go. Perfect. Little Perfect. Delay. Little delay. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to talk today about exercise and living with um, myasthenia gravis. Uh, so I, I always like to um, kind of when I talk about exercise, also keep in mind that it's about keeping active because many people think when we think of exercise we think of like the gentleman on the top left where he's kind of pumping iron well that's not always possible with myasthenia gravis so there are many other options um, exercise classing that really includes stretching and flexibility is very important important in working on balance and I like um, also including, if you can see on the bottom left, gardening if, with a raised bed, um, dancing many people like. So finding something you like to do to keep active is going to be important. So uh, always with starting, like what are those health benefits for exercise? And so there, there are many benefits. Um, and probably first and foremost in many people's mind is weight control. Because of the myasthenia, many people are inactive and um, so more sedentary, so they're not burning off the calories. We also put many people on prednisone, and so this tends to drive hunger and weight. So managing weight becomes very important. The heavier you are, the harder it is to, to move. Um, exercise can build strength. And so even though many of the muscles are weak, there is a capacity to improve the strength. Increased endurance means you're able to sustain an activity longer. When you are less active, um, balance does become affected. And when muscles are weak, there's a, a tendency for them sometimes to give way or just, you know, not be where you want them to be if you get yourself to the edges of balance. So working on balance is important. Um, building uh, more strength also can prevent injury with better balance across joints. Many of our folks, because of the inactivity and because of the prednisone, will develop osteopenia or osteoporosis or thinning of the bones. And so weight-bearing activities are very important for bone health. Because of the steroids and the inactivity, there's a greater uh, risk of high blood pressure, cholesterol, and abnormal glucose metabolism, and exercise can impact these. Also, exercise can improve strength or sleep, it improves mood, may reduce anxiety, and there are, there is literature now to support that it improves cognition as well. So before you start exercise, there are several things you need to ask is, is it safe to exercise with your myasthenia gravis? And so first and foremost is really making sure that you're not exercising when you're in a crisis or an exacerbation with the myasthenia. This is not the time to start. And many people, when they just develop myasthenia, ask, you know, so how about exercise? Always let's take it back a step and make sure that the, ex, that the myasthenia is in control before you start adding exercise. So exercise must be stable. And you need to, I put three and four together here. Ask your physicians or your care providers before you start that exercise. So we want to ask our neurologists, 
You also may want to elicit the advice of a therapist or an exercise coach, and also your primary care in case you have heart or lung diseases that may also be impacted with exercise. And then finally, you want to consider your total daily capacity for activity. Many people would find that if they take a trip to the store or they do something excessive, they will be tired. So you need to um, take that into account with exercise. So as you're thinking about exercise, I like to sort of have our red flags so we know where to, uh, where there's a problem with exercise. So first and foremost, if the, if there's an infection or illness, you want to um, avoid exercise. If the myasthenia is active, just like we said before, this is not the time to start exercise. If you're excessively fatigued, this is the time that you may have injury, so this is do not exercise. If the exercise produces increased soreness or new muscle or joint pains, then you've overdone it. And then if you can't talk or breathe, you know, you find that you're air hungry during exercise, we need to back that down and that may be a sign of a problem. If there's chest pain, if you have a racing heart or you feel irregular heart rate, that's the time to ask your primary about getting some other testing for before exercise, like a stress test. And then if you feel lightheaded or faint, we wanna make sure that you're well hydrated. That's not the time to exercise. So um, one of the things that I think is most important with exercise with myasthenia is really looking at breathing exercises. And I think this is one of the uh, foundation places that we can really impact. And many uh, patients say, what can I do? And I think even as we're uh, getting the MG under control and stabilizing, is thinking about breathing. And I'm going to flow from here to here, and then down here, and then across the side. So I really like this diagram in terms of the muscles of breathing. And there, there are a number of them. And first and foremost is the diaphragm. And it's very hard to see in this figure, but it's the muscle that's right here. And this is the primary muscle that you use for breathing, um, for inspiration. And when you breathe, the diaphragm moves down and it's like a bellow and it opens the lung and allows the air to come in. And so this is the muscle that we really want to engage. And you'll see on the next slide how to activate that muscle. So learning how to engage it is important. The next muscle for breathing in, taking air in, are the intercostal muscles. And these are on the, there are two sets on the rib cage. The intercostals are the, the rib muscles. And the ones on the outside actually pull the lungs out in the help you breathe in. And so if we go to our muscles of expiration on the opposite side on the top right, typically in quiet breathing, the expiration or exhale comes just from simple passive breathing. So the diaphragm will move back up to its resting position and then the intercostal muscles will just relax and allow the rib cage to come in exhaling. With active breathing, you actually will engage, this is the bottom right, those intercostal muscles that bring the air in. You may use your abdominal muscles to pull the rib cage in further, sort of getting out that last bit of air. And then finally, we have our accessory muscles. And these are muscles I don't like to, whoops, I don't know how I got there. Um, the accessory muscles are the ones that people use when they're in crisis. So people will tend to tripod and they will actually pull the rib cage up when they're just real air hungry. So 
I like exercises that will engage those breathing muscles. So yoga, Tai Chi, and just um, YouTube, you can go out and learn some exercises. But I think these are very important because at times of crisis, you've got a little reserve for the breathing and they will also help with performance when you learn to breathe with greater capacity. So what is the literature? So there were actually three studies of breathing exercises. And one of these was a randomized study where people were randomized to just standard therapy versus um, an actual training program. At eight weeks, three times a week, they were taught for 45 minutes how to engage breathing. And if you look on the top right hand figure, they learn how to do um, diaphragm breathing. So in diaphragm breathing, the abdomen expands out for inspiration, and that pulls the bellow down and allows the air to come in. And with relaxation, the belly goes in. And so this allows you to take a very deep breath. One of the most efficient breathing for active breathing is called the purse lip, which comes in through the nose, out through the mouth. And the goal of this is to breathe in a two to one ratio. So inspiring on one, a count of one, and out on two, and then increasing that. So if you breathe in on a count of two, the exhale should be longer on a count of four. And so if you look down below, there are a number of apps, Calm, Breathe to Relax, which actually have metronomes that help you visually breathe in and breathe out so you can train these breathing muscles. The final exercise they did was something called inspiratory muscle training, where you actually learn to breathe harder and faster in very short intervals. We don't want to do it too long because then you may hyperventilate. And with these programs, they actually found that there was improvements in the respiratory pattern. And I actually want to kind of describe what that 24% is. Um, so what they found is that the respiratory rate decreased. So with myasthenia, what happens is tidal volume, so the amount of air you move with each breath, decreases because the capacity to um, inhale, exhale gets much less with the respiratory muscle weakness. So what happens is the tidal volume, the amount you breathe, increases. And as that happens, as you can take a better breath, then you don't need to take as many breaths to compensate. So that improved by 24% in those that exercised. The other thing is if they measured how much the chest wall moved, it increased by 44%. Now, surprising to me, and um, they actually did not see improvements in some of the other measures, things like the vital capacity, where you expire as much as you can, it's one of the things we measure, and the negative inspiratory force, those really didn't change with these breathing exercises. And not surprising if you, when you stop it, they looked four weeks later, they were back to how they were before. If you don't practice, you can't keep this up. So these are activities you want to do on a regular basis. The next set of exercises is resistive training. And so this is weightlifting. And so we can do it with a pushing iron, like the guy on the uh, bottom right, or we can do this with um, hand weights. We can do it with TheraBands. And so the, the study that's in the literature is actually kind of interesting. So they took 11 individuals with mild to moderate myasthenia, and they put them into a weight program three days a week. And what they did was they lifted weights on one side of the body, and they served as their own internal control, and they did no exercises on the other side. And they saw no adverse effects, so just like a medication trial, there were no problems with the weight training, and they found that they got a 24 or 23% increase in the quadriceps, which is the thigh muscle in the front, muscle strength. It did not change the biceps, which is the muscle here, or the triceps strength, and they didn't see any change in muscle fatigue. Um, 
This is actually interesting because for individuals who don't have myasthenia, engaged in a three week or three month, which is 12 weeks, weightlifting program, you typically will get about a 30% strength gain. So, so they're getting what you would expect with a weight training program. All right, and this is where I think most of us should really start is really being in a, an aerobic training. So walking is probably one of our best exercises. It's important for our daily living activities. And so I like this study that just came out. It's called Restore X. And the, it stands for rest or exercise in myasthenia gravis. It was a three month study and they had two groups. People got randomized to regular care, which they called rest, or exercise 30 minute walks on a regular basis. And their primary endpoint was quality of life. And so this is a 15 point scale. Many of you probably have already taken it. And they were looking for a 50% improvement in that score. And what they found was the exercise significantly improved quality of life. Um, it also improved another scale for myasthenia called the activities of daily living. And this is a scale that looks at eight different symptoms. So do you have double vision? Do you have ptosis, trouble talking, breathing, arm weakness, leg weakness? And that improved as well. In addition, they did a six minute walk. And so with this walk, they have a stopwatch and they look how much distance you cover and they counted the number of steps that were taken during that walk. And they found that the exercise group significantly was able to cover more ground and they took more steps than the group that took rest. Now this is important because six minutes is sort of the distance that it takes to go in and get your prescription, so it, it just means those activities that you do in the community are going to be done with a greater ease and um, with less fatigue. And what I found interesting was this exercise across this three month, actually the group that did the exercise required less mastodon and they were able to taper their prednisone when you compared it to the group that did not do the exercise. So uh, as a practical point, it's the question is always, how do you get started? Like, so the most important thing you wanna do is find something you enjoy. So at our center, if you look at the top left, the cartoon says, dear treadmill, I hate you, but I need you. So relationships are complicated. Most people call that the, the treadmill, um, so treadmills are not for everyone. So find something you enjoy, um, whether it be rock climbing is a little extreme. Um, some people like retail therapy, yoga or chair yoga. Um, there's kayaking, you, you name it, there's an activity. Duck pin or bowling with a, a much lighter ball and the pins are smaller so it doesn't take as much force. There's pickleball instead of tennis. So there, there are so many opportunities out there, but find what you enjoy. So, so how does your myasthenia impact your ability to do exercise or participate in exercise? So I really like thinking about safety as you're getting started. So those drooping eyelids or double vision may impact your depth perception because we really need both eyes to tell us where we are in space. So it's important to really think about that with balance, going downstairs. Um, so maybe finding something that you can do, handrail support, doing something that's seated. And the other thing that happens is with myasthenia, a lot of times people report things that are visually active, just tire the eyes. So uh, think about that, like if you're doing virtual games, maybe consider something with less uh, eye stimulus. If you're outside, you want to make sure you've reduced eye glare, so wear good sunglasses. Um, I like these figures because um, neck fatigue, um, 
I have a number of people who enjoy bike riding. And so as has been mentioned, sometimes there's head ptosis. So there'll be weakness of the posterior neck muscles. And so if you're doing something like biking, like the gentleman that's in the lower panel, he's at an angle. And so he actually has to physically hold his head to prevent it from dropping. So if you're riding bikes, you may think about something that stacks the body in a more vertical position and has a little less um, need to actively support the neck. So, so that's something to consider. Um, I've had people who do things to support the neck while they're doing activities, if that's an issue. Um, arm weakness. So one of our tests is the quantitative myas, the, uh, the QMG, where we have people hold their arms out uh, and we test their ability to sustain an activity. So if that is a problem, then you find activities where you do an act, uh, one activity, then you change it. So you're always using and engaging different muscles. If your arms are weak and it's hard to get them overhead, and we still need to get range of motion in our shoulders and all our joints, consider doing it while you're laying down on the bed or walking the wall so that you can stretch those muscles. Um, with leg weakness, if you have hip weakness, consider something where you do um, a seated activity. Use handrails for support. I, as you heard, I really like doing breathing exercises, exercises that engage breathing. Um, and then monitor your breathing and make sure that while you're doing it, can you talk and you're not using a lot of the accessory muscles. Um, we do want you to get a little winded, so you get a little cardiovascular, but don't push too far. The other thing is if you have troubles laying flat, we call breathing troubles when you're laying flat orthopnea because what happens is when you're flat, your tummy muscles will push up against the diaphragm and then it makes it harder to take that deep breath. So consider an activity where you're more upright um, and so you don't have that trouble breathing. You may also find that if you bend down to tie your shoes, that compression of the abdomen onto the diaphragm makes it hard. So, so think about your body positioning. Um, trunk weakness. Um, I actually think the trunk is a very important set of muscles. And so we really need to look at having good posture. Um, the other thing is, is if we are crumped forward, then we can't expand the lungs and take a deep breath. Consider the time of day. Um, Many of you do better with your exercise early in the morning. Um, and then if that's the case, that's when you want to do your activity. Plan around rests. If you can't take a rest, wait till you can maybe exercise, take a rest, and give yourself five, 10 minutes to regroup. If you take Mestinon, you want to be on with your Mestinon, not at the end of that dose. If you're on an IVIG cycle, on those last few days before you do for IVIG, if you're very weak, take that time off. Um, if you're on a six month uh, course with your rituxan, that's the time that you wanna kind of watch and slow down. Um, heat will often aggravate myasthenia, so make sure it's cool. Do exercise in the air condition, do it in the early morning, end of the day when the sun's less hot, consider a cooling vest, and hydrate well. Um, so what sort of things may limit fatigue? Okay. Um, so I'm actually gonna pick up the speed just a little bit. There are things that may um, increase the fatigue with doing activity. And I picked these two slides. So a repetitive folding clothes, um, painting with the arms overhead, may actually aggravate the myasthenia. If you overdo it, um, the end of the day may be more difficult. If you don't get a good night's sleep or you don't get good rest, heat can aggravate it. So be very careful in hot tubs with a hot bath. And, and some people say hot foods or hot coffee will make the swallowing muscles worse. Humidity, um, 
the sun will tire the eyes more. Um, be careful with medications and always check with your doctor to make sure that the meds won't affect your myasthenia, alcohol. Here's our stress that we talked about with Dr. Amato, infections, inflammation, and then pot low potassium. And that can happen uh, with water pills uh, that are often used for diuretics or um, edema or with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, there's a study of cooling vests, which I actually kind of like. It was done in not too many people, but it was done in six people. And they used cooling vests, and then they did exercise without. And they found that um, the muscle strength on a muscle dynamometer, which um, called the Biotex, actually improved when people cooled their body temperature by one degree centigrade. And also the amount of like negative inspiratory force, a breathing muscle, where we look at the pressure they can pull in, got better with cooling. Um, you can do this on the outside or you can do it with a cooling vest. And so many people ask, where do I start? And so this is my last slide. Um, so, or next to last. Um, one of the things I think it's important is to know where you are with your myasthenia, to look at your medications, look at how many steps you take normally in your day, and think about how successful those days are. Um, and think about how long it takes to recover. So as an example, if you have a, a step watch like I have, and you take 1500 steps in a day, and you feel really good, you feel like you have plenty of energy, then if you do another day and you take 3,000 steps in that day, you're exhausted. It takes you three or four days to get out of bed because you overdid it. We need to note that too. So what I would suggest is if you're really good at 1,500 steps a day, try to keep yourself between 1,500 and 2,000 steps a day. And then if that goes well, advance that by 250 or 300 steps every few weeks it's sort of just like we as physicians adjust the prednisone we adjust your medicines very slowly we want to do the same thing with exercise um, and then i like to keep a journal i think it's important both for your mg taking this into your doctors so they know how your symptoms are but in terms of thinking about your activity I think it's important to track your progress. You know where you are. Many of us are very impatient, but if we can look back and see the progress we made, I think it's important. And so writing down how long you do an activity, how, ex how exertional is it? And I have a table to the left. How did it affect your MG? How long did it take to recover? And then the factors that influence, like the time of day you did it, time of your mestinon, other activities you did in the day, the amount of rest, the amount of sleep from the night before. You need nutrition to fuel, so if you're not, if you're missing meals, it may impact how you're able to exercise and making sure you're hydrated so you don't get dehydrated with these exercises. So I, I just wanna say thank you, and I'd like to take questions. And if you all have ideas and things you'd like to share about how you stay active and fit and what you find with your MG, I'm glad to have you share. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, we did get a couple questions that have come in. A couple have been um, in the same realm of swimming. So <laughs> is swimming water aerobic exercise, is that good for MG? What what are your thoughts on swimming and, aerob and water aerobics? So I have two things. So, okay. um, and, and one's commentary. So I have some individuals who find that being in the water actually feels like it restricts their chest. So, you know, if that's the case, find something else. Um, but I do like water aerobics because it's a whole body activity. And the other thing it does is because of the water, it unloads. So sometimes there's less work um, with the exercise. Okay. In doing it, two cautions. Um, when you start, I usually ask you to let the instructor know you have myasthenia. Start with 15 minutes. If that goes well, keep extending the time interval so then they'll understand when you leave. And then be careful with the heat because many of the pools are like 100 degrees or mm -hmm. more. 
Sure, sure. Um, what about those um, MG patients? Um, for example, this woman has a, um, a, a minor child who can't speak yet. So how does she know when she shouldn't have her exercise? Or how, how, what is her, how does she know when her child of that age is in crisis? Um, with kids, they just kind of stop. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, but it's the same thing as an adult. So okay. if, um, if the speech gets a little slurred, mm -hmm. if, if they look like they're a little more air hungry, if they're getting more stumbly, we're kind okay. of pushing to the end. Okay. Okay. Um, a couple people here have talked about having neck weakness. Mm -hmm. And twofold, would exercise help strengthen the neck? You know, I, I, I think picking the times a day that you're stronger. So the end of the day, that's when a lot of people find that their head is very weak or the end mm -hmm. of Mastodon. So um, I like to succeed. So I think while you're at the office or while you're working, make sure you've got a good supportive chair. Then you save that neck for later. Okay. Um, I've had people wear collars if they just find that their head just won't hold up. I've had people who can't enjoy a concert, they can't enjoy church, mm -hmm. where they sit without support. So I find the neck muscle is a very hard muscle to train. And we have another person that's asking, do you have an example of a neck or head support? And I know you said collar. Um, uh, is there anything in particular that, that your patients have used? So I actually found one that I, I do like, and I can actually have you kind of put it out. It, oh. it has, uh, I find many collars are very hot. Okay. And so that heat then makes the myasthenia, myasthenia worse. But um, there's one that has a little more support and it, it has a little bit more hold on the chin because many of the collars get soft and they still don't quite hold you up. Okay. And this one has, air vents that breathe. Okay. Do you happen to know the name of that? It's, I think it's Cabado, C-A-B-E-A-U. I just found it, it's comfortable, it breathes, and it provides more support, and I can give that to you. Oh, see, I, I, I actually just, see it. I <laughs> just put it, I just put it, I put a question mark, so I don't, yes. I don't know about my spelling. <laughs> and, it, and it's the Evolution Cool, so it, it's okay. one that, and it's Perfect. washable. Oh, very nice. Okay. Yeah, the, the cover of it's washable. Um, and this person just type, typed in here too, her Tai Chi classes have been canceled. And so now she is doing short walks and um, stationary bike rides. Good. Yes, there are lots of alternatives. So exactly. you can practice, practice what you know with your Tai Chi. Exactly. I know quite a few people who do Tai Chi that just find it very helpful. Did you um, see the person who was doing Tai Chi? What's that? That was me. <laughs> um, this person says that um, he's tried walking about a hundred yards, but my hip muscles stopped working. So I have to stop and wait about 15 to 30 seconds. I call it waiting for my brain to catch up to my muscle. Any <laughs> suggestions on what to do or why that might be happening? Well, it, I'm not sure what the brain is catching up, but uh, <laughs> um, but I do love, uh, I really like things that empower you with the myasthenia. So a lot of people say like with the walkers, I don't need a walker and I'm not going to do it. But mm -hmm. I really like the rolling walkers that are a little more rigid with the larger wheels that have the seat and the brakes. Mm -hmm. Because what the seat is higher than a typical bench. You can get out at the mall. You don't have to wait, you know, and find a seat because usually it's not where you want it so i actually find that's a good thing many of my patients love shopping because they have the shopping cart to hold on to so when they get tired they put a little bit more weight onto the cart mm -hmm. perfect well i don't think i don't see any more questions that have come through in the chat or the q a box so thank you very much for help, helping us on saturday thank you, thank thank you. you very thank much you. have a great rest of your day Thank you. Well, that is, um, concludes our MG symposium for today. Thank you all for joining us. I do want to thank all of our presenters and our panelists too for their time today. I would also like to thank again our symposium supporters, Alexian, Argenix, 
Immunovant, Momenta, and UCB. And then on this screen, this is that QR code I was talking about in the beginning. If you want, um, you can open up your camera and take a photo of the QR code and the survey will be prompted to open on your smart device. I will also be emailing the survey as well. And again, we appreciate your feedback. Also, we will be doing a random drawing to award one gift card to those who complete the survey within the first two weeks of this event. So take advantage of that. And if you have questions about the symposium, as I said before, it, it, it was being recorded, so we will have it on mda.org in a few weeks. But if you do have questions, please email us to the email that you see there at mdaengage at mdausa.org. And thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you join us with other Engage events. So have a great rest of your weekend.